What's going on guys? Hey, I just wanted to post this video as part of my strategy to tackling this Sunday sermon. Uh, this past Sunday I preached on Matthew chapter 19 verses 16 through 30, where we saw Jesus dealing with the controversy of the rich young ruler. Then of course he turns around and he teaches his disciples about what they will inherit in the kingdom of heaven. So the two subjects were entrance into the kingdom of heaven and inheritance into the kingdom of heaven. And I believe uh, personally within my theology that those two are entirely separated things. One is dependent on faith. The other is dependent on faithfulness. And so uh, all believers get into heaven based on faith alone. But there are believers who because of faithfulness inherit the kingdom of heaven. And I covered that in a number of scriptures on Sunday. And so... What Jesus is doing, though, here in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, is he's giving a parable about the labors in the vineyard. One of the reasons why I wanted to record this video for you is because I felt it would be too much to place into last Sunday's sermon, too many verses. And then for this Sunday, uh, maybe to just save from being overly redundant, I wanted to just cover it here via video. That way, for this coming Sunday, we would start with Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 to 34. Uh, so there's going to be a QR code in this week's bulletin insert. You can scan it. It'll take you to this video. Or, of course, you can just find it here on YouTube. So with that being said, this kind of helps us to speed along Matthew a little bit faster. My goal is to finish Matthew by the end of 2024, and uh, I don't feel the pressure to preach on every single passage. So with that being said, please have your Bible with you. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, the parable of the labors in the vineyard. Jesus says, verse 1, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Just due to the fact that he begins with the word for means that it's a continuation of his discussion with the disciples at the end of chapter 19. Also, if you'd look at the very last verse of this parable, verse 16, so the last shall be first and the first shall be last. He's giving them the same concept that uh, he gave in chapter 19, verse 30, where he said, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. So I think just because there's a chapter break here doesn't mean that there's a logical break in the, the conversation that he's having with them. So with that being said, verse 1, let's find out what the parable is all about. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. This was common in the ancient Near East. There was no welfare program if you were out of work. There was no union to protect your rights. If you were unemployed, then you had to go looking for work each day, and you were at the mercy of landowners who uh, would pay you themselves. So verse 2, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. So the agreement was, hey, if you come work for me, you receive a denarius, which is a single day's pay. Verse 3, he went out about the third hour, which is 9 a.m. in the morning in Jewish time. The day started at 6 a.m. for them. He went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour, which is noon, and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and find others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. So he got them at the 11th hour, that's 5 p.m. I actually think I made a mistake here. Those who he hired right away would have been 6 a.m., then 9, then noon, then 3, then you have it 11 o'clock. Nevertheless, he's hiring individuals all throughout the day. And so he's asking, why have you been here idle all day long? In verse 7, they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. Take the guys that started working at 5 p.m. and pay them first, and then give to the rest of the laborers. Verse 9 when those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a, denar a denarius. Now, if, if you were working prior to those who came in the last hour, you might have been thinking, man, he, he gave them an entire denarius. What will we receive? Look at verse 10. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received 
a denarius. So their expectations were not met. Verse 11, when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden in the scorching heat of the day? But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go, but I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own, or is your is your eye envious or jealous because I am generous? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. So there's a couple of thoughts here that I have with this parable, because actually it's pretty divided amongst commentators as to what it means. Uh, I think it's a continuation of the conversation with the disciples as it pertains to how God gives out heavenly rewards. Um, a couple of things that I, I have noticed, if you make this parable out to be heaven, then you have workers earning a wage. And I'm just personally not okay with that interpretation. <laughs> heaven is not earnable. Um, in the parable, the landowner is giving individuals a reward for their works, for their service. Um, so that is an interpretation, but I'm not, I'm not buying the interpretation. Um, another interpretation would be is that Jesus is trying to emphasize the attitude of the rich young ruler. He's done all of these good things, therefore what can he do to enter eternal life? And Jesus is um, basically telling him, you know, good job for you, but that's not enough to enter eternal life. And, and while I, I think that God's generosity here is obviously on display, I have trouble comparing the rich young ruler who's thinking that he can earn his salvation with those also who are the disciples because they would still have to be earning their salvation uh, here in, in view of the parable. And so, at least if we make the payment heaven, if we make the payment heaven. And so, while that might get closer, uh, I'm not sure it's the exact nature of what the passage is saying. Uh, some also believe that those who came early on, it's uh, Israel here in the parable, those who came late in the game are the Gentiles. And I think that could work in other contexts, but the problem with that is, well, the passage mentions nothing of Israel and Gentiles. He was just speaking to a rich young ruler who is Jewish and the disciples who are Jewish. So I don't know if the immediate context fits um, the parable. And so I think what's really happening here is Jesus did just get done teaching on rewards in heaven and the inheritance of heaven. And so I think he's comparing two individuals, two believers who have worked in service for him um, and their motives. So one served uh, because they expected payment. One served with the entitlement. One served with the idea that, hey, if I, if I do all of these things, then God has to repay me. Now, now he's in debt to me. Uh, while the other motivation of the people who came in and served late in the day, uh, they were dependent on the generosity of their master. And of course, we see jealousy and generosity, which ends the passage. And so uh, I think you have people working in this vineyard, laboring for this master. And I think although Jesus just taught on the inheritance and eternal rewards in verses 27 to 30, I also think he's trying to teach his disciples, but listen, yes, you will be rewarded, but just make sure that you don't serve me out of entitlement. Make sure that you understand that whatever I give to you in addition to entering heaven is an act of my grace, my generosity, uh, and I can do what I want with my possessions. And so um, some would say, and I'll, I'll even say this, I think the negative aspect to my view would be that I, I think in verse 30 of chapter 19, Jesus was comparing the, the rich young ruler who would be last in the life to come with uh, true disciples who would be first in the life to come. And so my view necessitates then that chapter 19, verse 30 has to be different in nature than chapter 20, verse 16. So the last will be first and the first will be last. My position is dependent on there being a change in the conversation with the disciples, meaning he's only talking to the disciples about the kingdom to come. 
Um, and now he's talking about how people will be rewarded. So I understand all the positions. If these are difficult for you, then I encourage you to read Constable's notes um, on the book of Matthew in this passage in particular. He kind of breaks it down a little bit, uh, and maybe he'll explain something that I missed. But nevertheless, I think uh, that the parable is suggesting that some can serve with an attitude of entitlement. You know, I serve God enough in certain ways, and I demand a certain reward. Uh, versus individuals who serve him just with the understanding that he's going to be gracious to you and to say thank you to you for your service at the end of the day. I think you see this in Luke 7 with the Pharisee and Mary Magdalene washing his feet. Uh, the Pharisee gave Jesus nothing upon entering the home. Mary Magdalene anointed his feet with her hair and with oil. Um, and then Luke 15, you see another you know act of motivation here, the prodigal son versus his older brother. The motivations of how they served were completely different, and God's generosity is always to though always given to those who serve with a great attitude. Uh, basically, it's His prerogative what He wants to give people at the end of the day. When He graciously rewards people for their faithfulness to working in His kingdom, then He gives what He desires. Um, there's a quote here from Constables that says. The point of this parable is that God will graciously do more for some of those who work for him than his justice demands. His servants should uh, serve him while trusting in his graciousness and goodness toward them, rather than calculating how much he owes them for their service. So maybe this parable was given to the disciples to say, yes, you're going to be rewarded. Just be careful of your attitude. Um, the first became last when they were entitled, in other words. Um Maybe just some final thoughts uh, in this parable. I, I think that if we're going to serve Jesus Christ and if, if we're going to serve him with all, all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and if we're going to serve him with the motivation of hearing, well done, good and faithful servant, again, we don't serve him in order to earn eternal life. That's just not the gospel. Eternal life is given by faith. It's by knowing Jesus. But I think you and I have to be careful with our attitudes with regard to the things we are doing for the king. Um, how is my attitude of service today? Maybe I've been serving in a particular area for a long time, and maybe I'm starting to feel entitled, or I'm starting to forget who I'm serving. Uh, God will also weigh in the balances your heart and your motivation as you serve. So um, the elongation of your service, the longevity of your service, doesn't necessarily guarantee a great reward for you as a disciple. And also, uh, somebody who serves in a, uh, a sacrificial way for a short window of time, they may be rewarded pretty heavily in the next life, such as martyrs. And so we don't know how God is going to reward. It seems like the scriptures speak in many ways to rewards in the kingdom to come. Uh, but we, we, don't, we don't do certain things in order to get certain positions. I think that's a misunderstanding of the doctrine of rewards in heaven. Um, I, I think what we do is we serve with the understanding that God will graciously reward us, but it's up to him as to how much he wants to give. And we will all be extremely satisfied uh, with whatever he decides to give us. Uh, that's just because of his grace and his generosity. So uh, I think he's uh, speaking about those in the kingdom who serve with poor motives versus positive motives. All right. With that being said, hope this was helpful. If you disagree with me, that's okay. Uh, email me if you have more questions about the passage, obcdakotasmith at gmail.com. Much love to you, uh, Ottawa Bible Church. And again, this Sunday we'll be in Matthew 20, 17 to uh, 34. God bless you all. Have a great week.